Welcome to worship. This is a good time and a good place for us to be together today. Please know that whether you're returning or this is your first time joining us, we are so glad to have you with us in this place. Our worship service for today includes communion, and so in these moments before we begin, I invite you to gather whatever it is you need for communion right where you find yourself today, bread, wine, cracker, grape juice, water, maybe even coffee, and to have it with you for worship. Our worship service, Authority in Words and Deeds, Belief in Action, is going to continue our walk through Matthew's Gospel. And today we're going to um, skip ahead a few chapters from where we were last week, but we're going to hear another parable about a vineyard that stems from a question of what and who is giving Jesus the authority to do what Jesus has been doing. And Jesus is going to invite the religious leaders in the temple to think a little bit about whether they are just yes men or whether they are yes men who also follow their words up with their actions. So today we're going to hear this call about the intersection of belief and action and how they kind of work together and the call to not just believe and to say we believe, but to live out that belief into, into the world. I'm also going to give you a little bit of context for the story we hear because sometimes I think it's really hard to hear all of what's happening or understand if we don't know what comes before or what comes after. So pay attention to some of those context pieces, which may actually in, open the scripture up to you in a brand new way. And so one more time, I invite you to gather whatever it is you need for worship right where you find yourself today and to find a space that feels comfortable and quiet um, for you to worship with us. You are invited, as always, to interact with worship through the comments, through the emojis, and through sharing our stream out there for those looking for a space to connect. And so I invite you now to join me in taking a deep breath. And welcome, my beloved, to worship. As always, the words that you see on the screen, the prayers that we pray, the songs that we sing, the even the communion that we take is invitation for you to participate in worship, however and wherever you find yourself. So please know that whether you want to pray out loud, share the peace with people or animals that are in your household, or simply follow along wherever you are, however and wherever you are, is always welcome in this place. And our worship service for today begins with the gathering. Please join me now in our call to worship. We come so God can teach us. We come so Jesus can lead us. We come so the Spirit can help us. 
Yes, my beloved, we come so that together we can learn to walk the way of the kingdom with goodness and justice, with compassion and mercy, with faithfulness and steadfast love. Amen. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's redeeming love And so let us pray our prayer of confession together. Because all lives are yours, God of mercy, grace is offered, hope is heard, and wonder is found. Because all justice is yours, Jesus, the life giver, our minds are transformed, our stubbornness is tempered, our selfish desires are reshaped. Because all hope is yours, spirit of sharing, our hearts are broken open, our joy released, our arrogance humbled. Because all is yours, even us, God in community, yet holy in one. We come before you as we are, confessing all and praying for your transforming grace. complain and question, when we put you to the test, when we say yes with our mouths, but no with our actions, when we wander off your path, when we fail to follow through on our intentions, 
empty our hearts of anger and pride, empty our souls of greed and selfishness, empty our minds of envy and mistrust, and forgive us. Reclaim us with your love. Amen. My beloved, hear the promise of Jesus spoken for you this day. God loves you. God forgives you. God strengthens you for kingdom work. So on this day, may God's compassion make us more passionate for service. May God's forgiveness make us more merciful for others. May God's love make us more gracious for the sake of the world. Amen. Please take this moment to share Christ's compassion, forgiveness, and love with one another, saying the peace of Christ be with you always. Yes, please take this moment to share Christ's peace with those with whom you may be gathered today and those with whom you are always gathered across all distances and divides. Our service for today continues with the word. A reading from the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. The message of God came to me. What do you people mean by going around the country, repeating the saying, the parents ate sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? As sure as I'm the living God, you're not going to repeat this saying in Israel any longer. Every soul, every life belongs to me, parent and child alike. You die for your own sin, not another's. Do I hear you saying, that's not fair, God's not fair. Listen, Israel, I'm not fair, you're the ones who aren't fair. If a good person turns away from their good life and takes up sinning, they'll die for it. They'll die for their own sin. Likewise, if a bad person turns away from their bad life and starts living a good life, a fair life, they will save their life. Because they face up to all the wrongs they've committed and put them behind them, they will live, really live. They won't die. And yet Israel keeps on whining. That's not fair. God's not fair. I'm not fair, Israel. You're the ones who aren't fair. The upshot is this, Israel. I'll judge each of you according to the way you live. So turn around. Turn your backs on your rebellious living so that sin won't drag you down. Clean house. No more rebellions. Get a new heart. Get a new spirit. Why would you choose to die, Israel? I take no pleasure in anyone's death. God, says God, the master, turn then and live. Word of God, Word of Life.
reading from the Philippians. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, and their tender affection and sympathy to make you, make my joy complete. Be the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you, that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself in taking the form of a slave, assuming to human likeness, and being found in appearances as human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that the name given to Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Then Jesus was back in the temple teaching. The high priests and leaders of the people came up and demanded, Show us your credentials. Who authorized you to teach here? Jesus responded, First, let me ask you a question. You answer my question, and I'll answer yours. About the baptism of John, who authorized it, heaven or humans? They were on the spot and knew it. They pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe him. If we say humans, we're up against it with the people because they all hold John up as a prophet. So they answered, We don't know. Jesus said, Then neither will I answer your question. Tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and said, Son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, I don't want to. Later on, he thought better of it and went. The father gave the same command to the second son. He answered, sure, glad to, but he never went. Which of the two sons did what the father asked? They said, the first. Jesus said, yes, and I tell you that crooks and prostitutes are going to precede you into God's kingdom. John came to you, showing you the right road. You turned your noses up at him, but the crooks and prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you, my beloved, from the one who calls us to be about the work of discipleship always. Amen. So I'm not sure who the magical lectionary gods are who choose our readings each week, but they are really starting to annoy me. Not so much because of the stories they pick, although they could definitely benefit from my opinions, but they are starting to annoy me because sometimes it feels like they have decided that their best course of action is to just randomly point their finger at some verses of scripture and say something like, well, let's read this. There has to be something important in here. And who cares if the people reading it have no context for it, because surely God will find a way to speak through whatever we have chosen. And while I'm guessing, God probably can figure out a way to speak through pretty much anything, including scripture taken out of context, I'm not a big fan especially when we live in a world as we do right now that has no problem taking things out of context and proclaiming them as gospel truth. And so just like I had to do last week with Jonah, let me once again give you just a little bit of context for our gospel story today. You see, our story for today takes place during the very last week of Jesus's life. He, along with his disciples, have decided to steal a donkey 
just a chapter or so ago, so that he, Jesus, can ride into Jerusalem to the sounds of the crowds cheering his name. And if that wasn't enough excitement for one day, Jesus decides after he enters the city that the first place he will go is the temple. You know, the place where God, his heavenly parent, was said to live and where he hung out that one time when his parents thought he was lost. And so he enters the temple, where he sees people all around him selling things and telling the other people who are entering beside him, rich and poor alike, that they're going to have to buy some animals to sacrifice if they want to have any hope at all of setting things right with God. Now, as you can imagine, Jesus is not pleased. In fact, when he sees this, he is angry, righteously angry angry. And so he decides to start chasing people out of the temple and overturning tables and what first and what seems like for the heck of it, curse a fig tree for refusing to produce any figs on demand. And all of that is just day one. Now, after what I am sure is a good night's sleep, Jesus once again decides to head back to the temple and teach. And like the good leaders they are, the chief priests and elders are nervous as soon as they see him enter. After all, Jesus has not exactly proven himself to be stable. And so those good church leaders walk right up to him, corner him actually, and ask him by what authority he is doing all these crazy things. In other words, Jesus, who do you think you are? Now, Jesus being Jesus, chooses to answer their question with a question. Yes, Jesus chooses to bring up in that moment his cousin, John the Baptist, the wild-eyed kind of crazy guy who by all rights should have been a priest like his dad, but instead decided from the middle of the wilderness to call people to come and repent to come and be baptized. And the rub, at least for the temple leadership, was that the people he called, the people he promised that God would lift up, weren't the good, faithful, temple-going people, but instead were the lost and the least. The ones told to stay on the outside. The ones told they weren't worthy of being loved by God's heart. And And those people? Well, They absolutely loved John, hailed him a prophet, knew that he is, okay, was, because beheading, the forerunner of God. And because those temple leaders know how much the people love John, they refuse to answer Jesus's question because they are afraid that someone might overhear their conversation and get upset with them for their answer, either positive or negative. And so Jesus, seeing this, seeing their hesitation, decides to do the another Jesus thing and to tell a story. You see, Jesus begins, there were these two brothers one who did for his father what he said he wouldn't do, and one who didn't do what he said he would. Now which one, he concludes at the end of the story, do you think did the will of the father? Now by all accounts, the answer to this question is a no-brainer, even for the temple leaders. It's the first brother, the one who eventually did what the father had wanted him to do, even though at first he refused to do it. But of course, once again, because this is Jesus, and if overturning the temple tables and cursing the fig tree is anything to go by, he isn't going to let those temple leaders off that easily. You see, Jesus says, leaning in and looking at them, at the buying and selling still going on all around him. You see, you, all you good leaders, you are that second brother. You are the yes men. You are the people who say all the right things, but who, when push comes to shove, when God shows up, you are the ones who don't actually do anything that is important, that furthers the kingdom of God. 
And just to turn the screws a little bit tighter, Jesus adds in for good measure. And you know those people you despise? Those people you hate? Those people you talk about under your breath? Those people you have decided are not really worthy? Those people you tax mercilessly and take everything they have to live off of for the temple? Those people who found their hope not in what happens here in this holy place that you have basically made a tomb for the living God? but who found their hope by the river with John. Well, those people, Jesus says, they are the ones who are being called into the kingdom. They are the ones being named beautiful and beloved. They are the ones who are like that first brother, going into the kingdom, not instead of you, but ahead of you. Yes, those ones who may have said no at the beginning, who may not have done their jobs they were assigned, or the ones that are considered important. Those ones who may have been caught up in things and life outside of right practices and holiness and temple life, who were on the outside. Yes, it is those ones, Jesus says. The ones who changed their mind and went who said yes with their lives, who met John in the river and heard the good news. Yes, it is those ones who did the will of the Father, who didn't mistake their own right beliefs and convictions for obedience to God, for saying yes to God's call. And while Jesus will continue on with his stories for at least another chapter or two, with his words that cut to the heart of everything that matters. You can almost feel, can't you, in this moment that our reading captures that something shifts inside the temple leaders that day. You can almost feel that in this moment, they decide that it might be best if Jesus were quieted, if he were arrested by the powers that be so that they can get back to doing what they have always done. Now I get that in this moment, it might be easy to judge those temple leaders because we know the rest of Jesus's story because we want to believe, right, that we would have been the first people to leave our fishing nets behind if Jesus had just said our name and then taken off down the road without anything but what we were wearing to share our faith and the good news of the kingdom with anyone who would listen. But come on, let's just be honest for a moment. Okay. I'll be honest for a moment, because here's the thing. As much as I would like to believe that I would be the kind of person showing up at the river with John, I am more the kind of person who says on Sunday morning that this week I am going to love all people without limit, but who then by Monday morning has already engaged in at least a dozen different ways of not doing it. Now, rarely are any of those ways mean or malicious. In fact, most of the time, they are so much more subtle. Like thinking about needing to call someone who is going through a hard time, rehearsing what I'm going to say in my head, then deciding to send a card instead, all the while congratulating myself on my thoughtfulness. But then, actually never getting around to doing it. Because, you know, I just got busy. Yes, the truth is, I am, that who I am, while I might like to say I am closer to a disciple or at least the first brother, the truth is, more often than not, I lean towards the second, towards the temple leaders. Yes, I am the kind of person who all too often gets beliefs mixed up with action, and maybe Sometimes you are too. Now the theological word for this, for this strange disconnect that happens between what we believe and what we do, is called sin. Which of course is inevitable and forgivable. But as a follower of Jesus, it is also painful. 
Yes, it is painful to admit that I can be the kind of person who says love, but does indifference, who says do right but does wrong, who says I will go, but then goes nowhere, who says blessed are the poor, but then thinks only of myself, who says give what you have, but then pulls all my resources just a little bit closer to my heart. And perhaps what is even more painful than all of that is that this sin, it is not just confined to me alone, to us as individuals, but this sin, it extends to communities and to churches too, to places and systems that block some people from the divine because of their status or age or gender or sexuality or even particular belief. And while I know that at least on this side of the second coming, chances are that more often than not, we and the church will often find ourselves acting like that second brother in Jesus' story. I wonder if by simply naming that, by simply telling the truth about who we are and how we often are in this world, by confessing that it is easier to be admirers than followers of the Jesus way. Yes, I wonder if by doing that, By feeling the pain that comes from those kinds of choices that mix up action with belief, if we end up opening ourselves up to finally hearing the invitation from Jesus and John both to be like that first brother. Yes, I wonder if it is our truth-telling of our desperation, our weakness, our vulnerabilities, our need for the very stuff of God to sustain us in this life. Yes, I wonder if it is our truth telling that will be the actual thing that makes room for God's grace to find space to work in this world and in us. Now, will doing this truth telling this confessing, this pain feeling, be easy? Of course not, my beloved. But it is exactly what we are called to do. To stop letting our faith be tied up in abstractions and intentions and good thoughts and prayers, and to instead let it be embodied to let it be confessed, to let it be the thing that we need more than anything else in this world, to let it be the thing that moves us from just belief to action, to kingdom living, to the heart of the one whose whole life was a living embodiment of God's words and promises. Amen.
Our service for this morning continues with the prayers of the people. And as always, I invite you to type any prayer requests that you have into the comments of our worship service, trusting that they will be held by me and by our community this week. And so drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. For the church, for wisdom and discernment for leaders, for the ability to speak the truth and witness to the good news, for creation, for the preservation of the environment, for advocacy for healthy waterways, habitats, and air. For those in government and positions of authority, for humble hearts, for care for the vulnerable, for our enemies for caregivers, for those who are sick or suffering, for encouragement and consolation, for healing to bodies, minds, and spirits. For our congregations and communities, for unity in the labor of love, for an awakening to the needs of those near and far, for the prayers of our hearts. for the promise of salvation with all the saints, for fearlessness in, in faith for those who mourn. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy and compassion. Amen. Our service continues with a meal. God feeds us with the presence of Jesus Christ. Let us pause to offer all of what we have and all of who we are to the one whose way is grace, love, hope, and wonder. And so may the God of truth be with you all. And also with you. Let us lift up our hearts to God. We lift them to the one who breaks them open with grace and mercy. Let us join in praising our God. With one mind, one heart, one love, we offer our thanks and praise to God. Amen. God, for whom we wait, for whom we long, as we do in our places what you did in an upstairs room, send down your Holy Spirit on us and on our gifts of bread and wine, that they become for us your body, as we become yours. For among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, This is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take it, all of you, to remember me. Amen. And so gathered around God's table, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So come to the table where love is given, taught, and shared. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. 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 
This is the blood of Christ shed for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And so may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Our service for today concludes with the sending. And so a blessing for all of you. We go with the mercy of God blessing us. We go with the life of Jesus guiding us. We go with the hope of the Spirit leading us. Yes, my beloved, we go walking in the way of the kingdom with goodness and justice, with compassion and mercy, with faithfulness and steadfast love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so go in peace, my beloved, trusting in the promises of God. And thank you so much for worshiping with us this week. And I cannot wait to worship with all of you again soon.